Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Hi, welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Tom O'Neill, and I'm a member of the Risk Advisory Group here at Equifax. Uh, Collectively, this team supports our clients by providing insights and guidance on how to navigate economic uncertainty and uncover hidden opportunities. My panel of experts today includes Dave Shoika, Jesse Harden, Maria Urtube, and Thomas Aleph. Welcome, everyone. Happy to have you on board. Great to be here. Happy Hi, to Tom. be here. So today we're going to be talking about the relevance of account management and account review frequency, given these times of uncertainty. But before we begin, let's kick things off with a quick economic update from David Fieldhouse, who's the Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? The July employment report adds another bit of good news as it further signals a labor market that is moderating in an orderly fashion. While layoffs have decreased, job gains have slowed, resulting in a rise of 187,000 payroll employment in July, which is slightly weaker than expected. While job and wage growth remains still remains a little too strong for the Federal Reserve's liking, average payroll gains in the private sector have significantly slowed and stand at just 185,000 over the last three months. The household survey also reflects a similar trend in the labor market, with the unemployment rate declining to 3.5%. However, the labor market continues to expand, which suggests a gradual softening of the labor market. The still low unemployment rate and the trajectory of wage gains continues to be a thorn in the side of the Federal Reserve. Average hourly earnings growth exceed expectations at 0.4%, though some of the strength is likely a result of a shifting job mix as growth in recent months has favored healthcare and the public sector over leisure and hospitality. The implications of the July employment report on monetary policy are modest, as the Federal Open Markets Committee uh, will have an August report before their next meeting. The FOMC has emphasized a data-dependent approach, allowing policymakers to adjust to new employment and inflation data in the coming weeks. We forecast that the terminal rate for the cycle has already been reached. So it'll come as no surprise to our listeners when I say the last three years have been packed with macro and microeconomic storms that have created huge amounts of uncertainty in the credit world. Uh, Shifts in spending behavior and and the influx of stimulus payments earlier in the pandemic period uh, really created an environment where credit balances and delinquencies were, were down and credit scores conversely went up. Uh, Since then, we've seen inflation rise, we've seen savings dwindle, uh, and we've seen an increase in delinquencies and consumer financial stress. All of this has led to an increased need to look for new ways uh, to detect risk in lender portfolios uh, and to do that early on and to distinguish between consumers who represent strong lending uh, opportunities uh, from those who represent uh, hidden risk, uh, even when those credit scores may indicate otherwise. Uh, So that with this in mind, I'll I'll ask our panel for their thoughts and recommendations on account management in this environment of change. Uh, So, Jesse, uh, let's start with you. I'll I'll start by throwing this question uh, over to you and have the others chime in as as needed. What is the most important thing a lender should be doing right now when it comes to account management? Tom, you picked me first. That's great. I did. Nice. Uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, happy to be on the the podcast here and, and uh, you know, love talking with you guys. I would say in terms of the most important thing, the the most critical thing lenders can do right now when it comes to account management, and I'm not trying to be flippant in any way, but is is really to actually use account management strategies. So this idea or the idea of booking an account and forgetting about it, you know, it's never a wise strategy. It's that that concept of, you know, hope is is not a strategy. So um, what I would say is managing a customer relationship, and I may use customer and consumer interchangeably here, but managing a customer relationship via account management really should be about understanding the value a consumer represents to the, to the lender. And value takes into account things like um cost, so real investment dollar or opportunity cost of that investment. And then, um, and then things like the benefit to the, the organization that that consumer brings. And so only I think after understanding value, 
Can the lender really uh, be able to determine how to develop strategies via account management that help promote growth and profitability uh, that that customer is going to bring to that lender? And so one of the things I'd also like to point out, account management, it's, it's not just risk mitigation either. So the portfolios I help cover in Telco and Energy, uh, they're acquiring customers and developing those customer relationships. That's clearly um, as important, if not more important of a strategy as managing or mitigating risk. So, you know, back to how I started the answer, what I'd say is lenders need to build an account management strategy that uses really all types of data uh, to help inform how the consumer will react once they become a customer. And it's imperative, you know, as we've seen, and you mentioned with the economic shocks that we've had over the past few years, whether it's COVID, inflation, uh, things like elections and loan forgiveness, that lenders need to be proactive with managing a customer across the customer lifecycle. And they should reach out, you know, as those customer situation changes. So I would say really knowing the customer and, um, you know, and building those account management strategies, that's the most important thing, you know. That's a great point, Jesse. And, you know, I would say that the account management strategy should be complementary to your adjudication strategy. What you do at the front end should be complemented by what you do once that customer has accepted whatever product offer you have given them. If you are conservative on the, on the initial line or loan amount or rates, account management allows you to be more aggressive potentially. The converse is also an option. Acquisition costs are usually much higher than the cost of retainment. So to your point, Jesse, about it's not you know, only the risk side of things, right? It's also keeping the customer. And whether that's through cross-sell, whether that's through line management, whether that's through reissue, all of these things are part of a cohesive strategy that work hand in hand. And the last point I'll make is, you know, we're in August. If you're looking to make adjustments to your strategy, um, again, knowing how much lead time it's going to take to go through your portfolio and have an impact matters. If you start a strategy in the beginning of the year, the impact of that strategy will be much more significant than if you put one in in November and expect it to change results for the year. Uh, good point, Dave. Um, and specifically, as you were referring to account management tying in with origination strategies, right? It should be a continuum uh, process, right? Continuous process particularly since the scores and the data that you use to make the origination decision, uh, of course, uh, is not as valid uh, after six months. Uh, you want to ensure that that picture that you are um, including and considering to make decisions to differentiate treatment of your customers uh, includes the best filters and co colors and, and definition, right, uh, to ensure, again, you can uh, make differentiated decisions. And, and that, in a way, will tie into the type of reaction and, and frequency of that reaction, right? What are you currently doing and how quickly do you want to anticipate or react to rising delinquencies or retaining customers that are uh, decreasing utilization? So some of the aspects uh, we might want to consider. Uh, those those are all great points, team. I completely you know agree with where Jesse started off with, uh, you know specifically around uh, you know thinking about account management and what are some uh, strategies that you can have accordingly. There, it just reminded me of this old infomercial uh, about the set it and forget it uh, rotisserie oven, where you could put a chicken on the uh, on the oven and uh, leave it alone, and then you know, miraculously a little bit later you go back and have this you know wonderfully cooked dinner. Uh, unfortunately, our, our practices in the account management space are are not. Not as uh, as easily uh, incorporated, but we can move closer to to that type of capacity. When I, uh, you know, we're, we're oftentimes in the risk world, uh, you know, viewed as uh, mitigators, uh, but risk can oftentimes be uh, you know generated as an enabler. And you and you, you've you probably heard if you've tuned into some of our things, I, I oftentimes talk about risk management from a quality control standpoint, where you can spend your money on uh, failure uh, prevention. Or appraisal, and the first thing, of course, is to do some form of appraisal of the situation. And the appraisal is going to really depend on your uh, the decision you're making. And then, as you move into uh, prevention, you know that's that's can should we spend our money now to understand what's happening uh, in the environment? Because the, the more accurate you are in your risk decision, the more uh, you can approve, the more positive decisions you can make instead of just uh, you know moving down from a, a decline or adverse uh, you know form of perspective. Uh, and then, of course, the last place is uh, when it 
refers to a failure. And, and of course, if you do nothing, uh, it's, it's likened to be very similar to the rotisserie oven where you didn't set the timer and you go back and the, and the chicken's burnt. Um, so I, I think from, you know, from there, we, we really want to make sure that we, uh, that from a frequency standpoint, understanding the decisions that are being made, how latent is the data. And, uh, and, and, and lastly, thinking about, uh, I, you know, I, I hear oftentimes the word alternative data. And when I hear the word alternative, uh, it's very easily, uh, you know, thought of like, you know, in, you know, in the sense of something different and smaller, but it's not necessarily different. It just means you have more options. And so if something is an alternative, that means you have a, another option to address a situation. And, and in the credit world, of course, uh, it is very oftentimes viewed that a, you know, a credit file is, uh, is, you know, first and foremost, the, you know, the most important. And it oftentimes is if you're making a credit based decision, but if you're looking at things like, uh, you know, capacity to pay, then, uh, you know, you know, sources of information that are more of a mainstream type of alternative data would be like income verification, or as you move downstream, trying to understand like you know wealth and assets that uh, that may exist, or even has that consumer uh, started leveraging data source or not data sources, but lending instruments that are not even traditionally reported to the credit file, you know, such as payday loans uh, or, or the like, uh, and and then being able to incorporate that information for the decision being made to you know to be able to maximize your um, uh, I guess enablement and minimize your risk. Tom, that's that's a, a fascinating point. I do want to get back to uh, what you're talking about, the you know, alternative data, quote unquote. I also want to you know, talk to you about rotisserie chicken, but we can save that for a different time. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Maria, I wanted to touch on something that you had brought up in terms of the frequency of that cadence of how, how often you're monitoring the activities on your portfolio, which from a risk perspective, I get that. That makes sense that you're, you're trying to gauge that risk as early as possible. But uh, but obviously, that also comes with increased costs and, and effort on the client side. Uh, how would you advise lenders you know, going into you know, that suggestion of, of how they can be aware of you know, what that trade-off is like and if that increased you know, uh, investment is worth it before they commit? Uh, thank you for the question, Tom. And that goes back uh, in a way to that question on on where are you at right now and where do you want to be? What type of or how quickly do you want to react to the knowledge of uh, someone falling into delinquency or someone about to close their uh, credit card with you, right? So exactly, there is an additional cost and an additional volume potentially uh, of having differentiated actions and more frequent actions. But based, of course, on the analysis we've conducted to assess and going to an extreme case, right, from an annual account review or also known as portfolio review to quarterly, for example, there's an improvement in terms of dollars saved from identifying bad uh, accounts uh, uh, more effectively uh, of 3.5 times. And, and even if we look at the other extreme from annual to monthly, that's uh, six times improvement in, in that identification. So which means that even from quarterly to monthly, that's a 1.7 uh, times improvement. So in a way, that improvement and cost saving uh, mitigates or, or suggests and, and proves the point that that investment is worthwhile. Got it. So, so basically any clients you know, looking to, to increase that cadence can, can pretty easily do the ROI based upon the, the risk savings that they'd be having, as well as the opportunity that they could, they could be gathering. So, so Tom, let's go back to the, the point that you raised. And then Dave, I wanted to ask you about uh, yeah, some of the, the hurdles facing clients you know, in managing their, their strategies. But, but before we do that, I, I asked Tom that I wanted to go back to the alternative data. Obviously, and, and I think you referenced this, it, alternative data as a label has sort of a stigma to it. So a lot of, uh, a lot of lenders look at that and they say, well, it's not applicable to my customer base or, uh, or, or that only fits a certain population or that's not ready for prime time, things like that. How would you advise you know, clients who are you know, considering this, but maybe not comfortable with, with using anything outside of the traditional core credit data that they're used to? That's a great question. Um, I think you know I, we we do get that question a lot, so I, I imagine that's why you're uh, posing it here, uh, you know, because uh, and and I think I think the first starting point is uh, understanding why and you know having a sense of curiosity that if uh, you know if someone is telling me that they've not uh, had use or understood 
like, you know, ha- has some form of other data, you know, been applied? Well, I- I'd want to understand what that's been like for them. What has their experience been with, uh, you know, testing sources? When have they tested them? Uh, have, you know, has it been incorporated? Is there, yeah, and, and what has been that, uh, you know, the, you know, the finding? Because there, there have been, uh, you know, if we look across, uh, you know, very, all industries, all verticals and decisions, uh, there's, there's typically some form of data set that is oftentimes a primary level of decision, uh, de- depending on what's, uh, what's being incorporated. But then there's usually some other choices that can be made uh, that can help uh, add on to that. And, uh, and, you know, so then, you know, if I think about some of the reasons that uh, can stand in the way, it's like, well, is there, is there enough value there? And that comes down to some of the points Maria was making. Of course, there's going to be trade-offs uh, with, uh, you know, you know, frequency, but also additional data. And there's going to be diminishing marginal returns uh, associated with any overlay or, you know, things that come on top of that. And uh, I think the, the second part that I would really want to understand is uh, if these sources of information were tested in uh, different economic time periods, you know, to see, like, you know, was there, was it not necessarily needed? Could all of the goals have been met? Uh, you know, could, you know, could the risk, uh, you know, thresholds been um, mitigated, you know, with, with existing sources of information without having to, you know, to add additional sources. Uh, but when we get to an environment where, you know, things are a lot more volatile, things are shifting, um, it does become, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, I guess more pertinent to be able to understand and test that information. And, and so, you know, oftentimes when I think about it is you know, we're, now we're at the point where it's really important to understand and test. And that's why even when we're not in an uh, uncertain economic cycle, that's when we should be examining these things to know what, what should we be ready for if that next wave potentially hits. Great. Thank you very much for that. Dave, uh, I wanted to go back to, to something that you had raised. You, you talked about the, the importance of keeping your strategies up to date, of being able to react fluidly and so forth. Um, but I think we could all agree that we're, we're all in rather unique times. Uh, how do you build history? I mean, we, we could take student loans as an example. You know, this is a rather unique situation that none of us have ever seen before. And, and obviously that limits us in terms of the, the data and the history that we could use to build strategies. H- how do you respond to lenders who are faced with this obstacle when they're trying to, to develop new strategies to react to these unique circumstances? Thanks, Tom. And I'm going to use a prop here. So this is my glass half full, empty. You decide. Yeah, I mean, the the closest thing we have to this quandary, if you will, and I'm going to call it a quandary, we'll get into, uh, into the discussion, I'm sure, is um, the, the mortgage crisis, all right? That was a, a time where the, un, the unforeseen actually happened. People said, I don't want to pay my mortgage because I'm underwater, and they defaulted, and that cascaded throughout the financial service, you know, financial industry. Here we have an unknown debt that hasn't had to have a payment on it for three years. And consumers are sitting there thinking about which do I pay? And the gamble that lenders have is that those consumers with the federal student loans that are coming out of accommodations that are going to have to start payment in October are still going to pay them. And so from an account management perspective or an account review perspective, it's understanding how many of your customers have these loans on their credit file. And then once you kind of size that, look at it through various windows, right? It's what income band are they in? How long have they been a customer with you? How many relationships do they have with you? And then figure out, well, okay, well, what kind of product am I offering and what can I do about it? If I'm an, a mortgage lender, if I'm a, an auto lender, or an installment uh, loan provider, there's not much that I can do from adjusting that loan only on the negative, on the other side of maybe re-aging, restructuring, issuing a new, you know, refinancing to that point. But on the revolving side, which has been a lot of the discussions here today, there are things that you can do. And really it's, it's identifying that piece. And so I would say from, you know, our, our client's perspective, it's okay. I've assessed the risk. I've identified the pockets whether that's large or small, that's going to differ based upon the industry that you're in and then deciding, well, what can I do about that? And so, you know, again, it might be attributes that you, you know, purchase from a provider and this would be an opportunity to learn. I think, you know, uh, Tom has brought up a great point with data, taking a, you know, a chance and looking at, you know, a, you know, some new attributes or even existing ones that maybe you're getting, but you actually haven't used might give you some insights along with identifying whether it's the student loan piece or, or rising delinquencies or tightening of, of utilization rates. 
and then deciding, well, what can I do about it? What is my what does my credit policy say that I can do? Can I be proactive and, and cut lines on, on a potential risk off of me? I'm seeing delinquencies off of me. Can I do something about that? Can I, you know, I mentioned in my you know, my opening comments uh, earlier in, in the podcast about customer retention cost versus acquisition cost. And that's really, again, all those points I laid out, the number of products, the length of relationship helps determine what you want to do. Is that consumer a relationship that I value? Then I'm going to treat that person one way. If this is a first time customer with me, doesn't have a lot of exposure with me, I might take a different approach because I don't value that, that relationship as much. So really it's, it's determining almost you know, who do you want to be? And that can be many things to your different customer groupings, but it's making sure that you have that clearly defined and that you are allowed to action upon that. So, so whereas we may be you know, sort of traditionally looking at you know, this as a you know, purely analytic and data-driven you know, process, in reality, there's there's subjectivity to it. There's business objectives that are looped into it. There's customer relationship objectives that are looped into it. So being able to incorporate all of these things, especially in times when maybe historic data around the, the types of metrics that we're looking to measure you know, may be lacking given the, the situation that we find it, there's still things that we could do based around you know, these other activities that we're marching towards. Jesse, I, I, I didn't want you to feel like uh, we had forgotten about you. You were the first one out of the gate, and 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 you've been sitting there, yeah, you know, quiet this whole time, which is so unlike you. Um, so I wanted to go back to you and, and say that you, know, you you started this this whole thing off by saying that the first thing that lenders should do is is to actually utilize the account you know, management activities and, and the account review information if they're not already doing so. Just so that everyone that's, that's listening here has a, a good understanding, can you explain what you mean by that account review information and what the added benefit of using that is over anything else that they might be doing? Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, I can't I can't sit quietly, uh, contrary to what people tell me. So in terms of account review, so the reality is, you know, account review really starts with the information a lender collects on their own about how customers react. And we call that on us data. And so having a robust enough process to collect those on us characteristics, things like payment trends, payment amounts, balances, information about responsiveness to offers, uh, how a customer likes to be communicated with, what types of new forms of credit relationships should be a priority. Those are the, the things that would be a first priority for understanding in terms of how that customer looks. So after lenders gain a better understanding of, a, uh, of customers' preferences and actions based on that internal on us information, uh, I would recommend then looking at other sources of information to help inform those strategies. What does that mean? So, you know, though internal information is, it's a really, a, you know, a good starting point, gaining that outside information is going to help build a comprehensive account review process. And it's really uh, critical to getting the most out of that customer experience. And, you know, the question is why? And really, because that external information, things like credit bureau data, which I think we've talked about some scores, attributes, triggers, all of that helps customers see the whole picture. You know, for example, losing or getting a new job, getting a raise, moving to a new home or city, expanding a family, those are all the most impactful life-changing experiences. And those experiences are really going to mean the customer will react differently to offers, you know, or to expanding an existing relationship. So I would say as lenders get more sophisticated in using additional data sources in their segmentation process, lenders really get a better understanding of how to segment and, and how they can drive that proactive outreach and loss mitigation strategies um, as much as, as being reactive. And so lenders will find, you know, being both proactive and reactive can help, again, through their account review process, it can really help drive a better decision, you know, as they manage those accounts that they've spent really, you know, priceless resources to acquire. So I'd say, again, it's critical to really both marry both that internal data, which is, again, is on us data, and that external information to make the best decision about how to manage the relationship with that customer. And that external data that you referenced, that's that's largely you know, a lot of what you know, Thomas was, was talking about in terms of looking beyond just that traditional 
uh, core credit data that's that many of us are used to and and looking beyond just what's on on our existing portfolios as, as, as the client and then yeah tying the rest of it together you know we then yeah can bring in you know what Maria was talking about said looking at the the frequency and the cadence of of how often we're reviewing that and, and varying that based upon what we're seeing in our portfolio and how the performance is like and what we're seeing in the the macro environment and to Dave's point you know using all of that information to you know, to make sure that we're keeping our strategies as as updated and as fluid and as relevant as, as possible so did, did I uh, sort of tie all of those threads together decently enough? Any Anyone have any additional comments that they'd like to uh, to add before we close up? Yeah, Tom, I was just going to, I was going to say one thing. I mean, again, it's, it's may sound cliche, but you know, we talked about it, I think on our last podcast with student loans and really the idea is just that proactivity. It's, it's not being scared, you know, being prepared with data, being prepared with internal information and really figuring out how you build that segmentation to use that data. So thank you, everyone. This has been a great discussion. I uh, want to thank each and every one of you again for joining me today. Uh, for our listeners who would like to know more about this topic, please reach out to us at riskadvisors at equifax.com, or you can simply reach out to your local Equifax sales contact. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.